<laughs> hey guys, I'm here to talk about boat stuff because I have a brand to maintain. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about Irving and XC Johnson and their travels around the world. Uh, these are two of my sailing heroes. So our story begins on a farm in Hadley, Massachusetts, where Irving McClure Johnson was born on July 4th, 1905, super patriotic, and Hadley is way inland. It's nowhere near the sea, but that didn't stop a teenage Irving from training for his dream job of working on board the mer uh, merchant marine fleet. But how does one train to be a sailor on a farm? Well, like this. So this is actual footage of a teenage Johnson scaling a telephone pole in preparation for going around Cape Horn on a full rigged ship. <laughs> Super accurate. So after spending a few years working on steamships, Irving has the opportunity to crew on one of the last sailing cargo ships still going around Cape Horn. And while I dig the enthusiasm, it's not actually required that you do a handstand while working aloft. I'd actually encourage you to not do that. So in 1929, a 24-year-old Irving, get it, oh, get it out of your system now, folks, because it's gonna be a lot. So 1929, 24-year-old Irving Johnson takes his ditty bag and a handheld camera on board the bark Peking. The result is some of the most exquisite and rare footage from the golden age of sail. In 1980, he rewatched the footage and added commentary. The result is a DVD that you can still buy through Mystic Seaport. You can also find this on YouTube. And I wanna share a clip that I think really captures the daredevil spirit that was in all the sailors that chose to sail around Cape Horn. Uh, so in this clip, I'm gonna set it up a little bit. He's climbing down from the top of the most forward mast on the ship to the very front of the boat, to the very tip of the bowsprit. So, let's see. From the top of the foretopmast to the end of the bowsprit, some 17 stories down. And of course, you're not supposed to use your uh, legs for gripping the stay. If you do, you'll wear out a pair of brand new pair of dungarees in one trip down. Simply hand over hand up, hand over hand down, and no sliding. That's only done in Hollywood when they get something special on their hands. No sliding. That is absolutely not only frowned upon, you just can't do it with any skin left. Now, I read about a fellow, again, I didn't know whether it was a, a truthful book or, or just a novel of some sort, and I, a fellow came down the edge of sail, so I get, gave it a try, and another fellow got pictures of me, and uh, I found I could do it, even though I had to hold the fingers straight and thumb straight and pinch the canvas between the ends of my fingers and thumb, a most insecure feeling, but it did work. A most insecure feeling, but it did work. This accurately describes many aspects of my life. <laughs> so the best part about watching this whole movie is that you will end up speaking like Irving Johnson for about a week. There are a lot of weird little turns of phrase in there. At one point he talks about people who are up furling a sail and he says, well, you know, they weren't up there playing tiddlywinks and it's just so good. <laughs> I wish that my talk was just watching that, that documentary again. Uh, anyways, so we cut to a few years later and Irving has made a pretty solid career out of working as first mate on board some of the finest sailing yachts in the world. And it was on board this schooner, West, or Wander, sorry, Wanderbird, where he met Exie. At the time, she was a college student on a year abroad in France who had never sailed, but tagged along with a friend who had booked a transatlantic passage on the boat. And according to Lore, one evening at sea, Irving tucked Exie under his arm, carried her to the end of the bowsprit for an unobstructed view of the sunset. And it's a move that doomed every future couple to never have as cool of a first date. <laughs> the two married in 1933 and continued to sail. And they decided that their travels around the world were missing something. But while most people who make a habit out of voyaging are constantly upgrading their boat or their gear or their tools, the Johnsons decided that something different was missing. Teenagers. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever had the enjoyable experience of going on a road trip with a 16-year-old, you're probably thinking, yeah, doing that, but with a dozen of them on a boat for 18 months sounds great. No? All right, well. So for each voyage, the Johnsons would bring on a new team of youth to sail around the world. And they made these circumnavigations in two vessels, both named Yankee. Uh, the first was a 92-foot pilot schooner, which took them around the first three times. 
And the trainees who came on board were interviewed and handpicked by the Johnsons. They were mostly from a kind of well-off background. Uh, they were paying for the privilege of this whole adventure. And typically the route followed from Gloucester, traveling south down the eastern seaboard, through the Panama Canal, across the South Pacific, through the Indian Sea, around the Horn of Africa, and then back home across the Atlantic. And of course, sometimes things went wrong. Exe was often the one at the helm when things got dicey and Irving would have to go aloft in the rigging to fix something that broke. And on their second voyage, Exe was actually the one at the helm when they approached Pitcairn Island while most of the crew, including Irving, were below deck suffering from food poisoning. Ugh, it's not good. And even on the first voyage, Exe journaled about their misadventures. Uh, like when they returned and they saluted Gloucester, they fired a little cannon, a little charge out of their cannon, and quote, the cannon blew off a corner of the wheel box, ripped up the stern sheets grating, poked a hole in the bulwark sheathing, three holes in the mainsail, two in the ensign, and the peak of the gaff. Our lovely solid brass cannon was in smithereens. I know there are a lot of nautical terms there, so I'm gonna break it down for you. Everything broke, lots of things broke, lots of things went boom. <laughs> So they completed their next four voyages on the second Yankee, which was steel hulled and rigged as a brigantine. They also designed and sailed a third catch that carried the same name Yankee, but that vessel stayed on intercoastal waterways in Europe because after seven times around the world, some laid back river cruising probably sounds pretty nice. So the idea of teenagers running off to sea isn't a new one. Most vessels in the age of sail were crewed by young adolescent boys, uh, and that's everything from Navy sailing ships to merchant marine ships, yes. <laughs> Brigantines, schooners, get more specific, people. <laughs> so, but by the time of the Johnsons, more modern steamships had rendered the need for a large crew of expendable child labor pretty much obsolete. <laughs> So the Johnsons really originated that this idea that going to sea wasn't just a way to make a living, but a way to build one's character and do some personal development. Working on board any ship is both physically and emotionally challenging. It requires you to take responsibility for your actions while also collaborating, collaborating with your crew. And this quote from Exe's journal captures the attitude of some of the boys at the beginning of their first voyage. Quote, they're a nice lot of boys, but it doesn't seem to have occurred to them to do things for themselves. Perhaps a lot of it is adolescence. They're bound to improve. <laughs> so their voyage has laid the foundation for the formalization of sail training as an educational concept. And when you boil it down, sail training basically means developing practical skills and character through the process of busting your ass on a sailboat. The Johnsons also influenced some early sail training nonprofits, like the Sea Education Association. Uh, Irving actually served as a trustee on that board until his death in 1991, after which Exe took his place. And Sea's first vessel, Westward, was based on the lines of the schooner Yankee. And if you travel more locally down to Southern California, you can find Los Angeles Maritime Institute, who in 2002 launched their twin brigantines named, you guessed it, Irving and Exe. Exe even lived long enough to christen the ship named after her. And that's what that little picture is right there. I love this, 95 years old and christening the ship named after you. I aspire to this level of badassery. <laughs> In 2015, I had the opportunity to work on board Irving Johnson as an instructor and deckhand. While the original Irving and Exe took on board affluent students for their voyages, Los Angeles Maritime now focuses on serving disadvantaged and at-risk youth from the LA area. And although I wasn't around for their voyages on Yankee, something tells me that the look of pure, unadulterated wonder on a trainee's face when you take them aloft for the first time is still probably the same. So I'd like to raise a glass to the daredevils of the past and the ones who work to inspire daredevils of the future.